Okay, guys, it's Natalia Reagan. I am a Star Talk All Star host, and we are actually replying. This is Todd Disatel, or Todd Disatel of NYU. He is a molecular anthropologist and biological anthropologist, and I'm myself an anthropologist. And we wanted to respond to Tim Allen's tweet. Basically, uh, if there are, are apes, uh, or if we came from apes, why are there still apes? Uh, well, it's a good question. Uh, it's been asked many, many times. Todd gets it all the time as a professor. And we wanted to address that question because, again, there are a lot of people that ask this, especially those that question evolution. Well, the short answer is we did not evolve from apes. We have a common ancestor with apes. And, and Todd has a really great analogy that I wanted him to share. So the analogy that I like to use is we obviously are descended from our grandparents. And so if we're descended from our grandparents, why are there still cousins around? Yeah, why are those cousins still around? I mean, and, and someone could say, if dogs evolved from wolves, why are there still wolves? They didn't evolve from them, they have a common ancestor. And so, uh, in the instance of apes and, uh, well, actually one thing we should clarify is humans actually are apes. We belong to the family Hominidae, which includes all the great apes. I always joke that some of us are greater than others. But the great, great apes include chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, orangutans, uh, and humans. And humans. Mm. But uh, our closest genetic relatives are bonobos and chimpanzees, and we uh, diverged about from a common ancestor that we share with, with chimps and bonobos. And then chimps and bonobos diverged about give or take. So uh, that's basically how that happened. And, and the thing is, they're still evolving, right, Dr. Todd? Yeah, they, they are literally just as evolved as we are. You have a common ancestor, and for the last six million years, they've been going on their own way. We've been going on our own way. So anything living on the planet today is equally evolved, even bacteria. Yep. It's like that Fleetwood Max go your own way. We're just going to keep going our own way, right, Dr. Todd? Yep. Yep, yep. So, yeah, I hope that it helps clarify, and if anybody asks you that in the future, just remember it's a common ancestor, and that evolution isn't necessarily goal-driven, you know? It's, a lot of people say, well, why aren't monkeys going to one day become humans? Well, they don't have to. They're doing, they're doing okay as monkeys, right? Getting along just fine. So, do we have any questions? Anybody want to, you know? That right there is a Diet Mountain Dew. It's very popular with the great apes here in this lab. By the way, we were in the NYU Molecular Anthropology Lab that Dr. Todd runs. How long have you had this lab? 25 years. Yeah. Probably longer than many of you have been alive. Not me, but many of you. So, any, oh, why aren't there dinosaurs if we have birds? Great question. It, it is a very good question. It is a good question. Well, I mean, 65 million years ago, uh, an asteroid hit off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula modern-day Mexico, and that decimated many of, well, all of the dinosaurs, and a lot of what survived were the smallest of the small, um, some of them being small mammals, which then gave rise to bigger mammals after that big Mesozoic extinction. But the dinosaurs that did survive were the small, warm-blooded birds, which were able to better forage and survive in what would have been basically a winter environment with a lot of the vegetation, the seed, flowers, the insects, everything wiped out or at least dramatically reduced. And so a small, warm-blooded animal, like a bird or a small mammal, was able to survive. And this is something that actually we've talked about before when uh, we've been questioned about, like, would, could there be Planet of the Apes? Uh, it's a great question, too. I mean, obviously, we have many movies about that. Dr. Todd and I have the same theory that it would probably be Planet of the Macaques, and the reason being is they are able to survive in about any environment out there. So that's really key. Survival is not necessarily being big and strong. It's about being able to adapt and survive. They're often macaques, which are monkeys, by the way, mm -hmm. are actually often referred to as a weed species because they can live in and thrive in marginal environments alongside humans uh, just about anywhere. And they're next to humans. They are the most widely ranging primates in the world. Yeah, they actually, they, 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 uh, you've probably seen the Japanese snow macaques, smart enough to use hot tubs. Yep. I mean, Desert, who wouldn't use a hot tub? Deserts to mm -hmm. mountaintops. Yep, absolutely. So I always joke it's going to be macaque attack. <laughs> What's the closest link to our ape ancestry? Are we talking seven months? I'm going to go. So about 
six million years ago, maybe just a little before that, we shared a common ancestor with the chimpanzee. So it wasn't a chimp, it was the common ancestor of humans and chimps, just like your grandparent is the common ancestor of you and your cousins. And so when that species split into two, it went basically extinct, but it had descendants, one of which ultimately gave rise to the two species of chimps, and one gave rise to um, all of the hominids, so mm -hmm. all of the Australopithecines, uh, early Homo, the Neanderthals, and all of those guys, and we are the last relative standing from that particular branch of the family tree. It's kind of like your paternal ancestry versus your maternal ancestry. They're separate, but you are comprised of both of them. Yeah, and it's, I mean, the, and just to explain that the, the study of this hominin ancestry is called paleoanthropology, looking at our human origins, understanding that some of them led to different branches, but some of them were dead ends. Uh, one of my favorite hominin species is Paranthropus boisei, which is this really cool looking, uh, really neat looking skull, big old flaring cheekbones, big, you know, crest on top of its head, huge molars, but a dead end. Nicknamed Nutcracking Man. For good reason. I wish I had a skull right now. I feel, I actually have a Boise eye necklace. Rock sometimes. It's my swag. swag. With all the advances in the biomedical field, has, uh, has that caused humans to stop evolving? Or has that simply slowed the process since it's easier to survive? It's yes. a really good question. And that, oh, sorry, that's from, I, I'm not giving people shout outs like I should, I'm sorry. That's from Christina Marie Hernandez Pripke. I hope I'm saying your name right. <laughs> So this is a question I get all the time. I actually teach courses on health and human evolution. And we are still evolving. One of the most basic definitions of evolution is actually a change in allele frequency over time. So every time new immigrants enter some place, any time basically a baby is born, you have a new combination of alleles and the frequency of those alleles, and so you are having evolution. Um, while a lot of people think we've stopped evolving <laughs> because we save people's lives who wouldn't have survived in the past. I mean, if I was out on the savanna right now, without these glasses, I'd be leopard fodder be, yeah. overnight. He'd be, yeah, lion kibble, essentially. But that's a, a sort of a minor component. Um, we are changing our gene frequencies and allele frequencies. The diseases that spread around the world cause people who are better able to survive certain kinds of diseases to have more offspring than others. So evolution is a continuous, ongoing process. We're playing with it on the edges with some of our biomedical advances, but we're not stopping it. No, really. in, in fact, we may be accelerating with the things we're doing to the environment, the chemicals we're exposing ourselves, we're creating a new evolutionary environment that causes us to have to respond to it. We're a great evolutionary force. I mean, even looking at bacteria and antibiotics uh, and how those are quickly evolving. Uh, okay, can, uh, Adnan Khan Wazir asks, can we predict evolution? How species will evolve in the future? Ooh. That's another good question. Well, so I can tell you absolutely, <laughs> we will go extinct. All species go extinct. 99.9% yeah. .9 of all species that have ever lived are now extinct. And so, that, and it might not be in a bad way. We might actually shift and change and evolve, but you know, a million years from now, you wouldn't recognize people as we see them today. So we would still be their ancestors, so some of our genes will have survived, but the things we call homo sapiens may have shifted or changed by then. And something to really take into consideration is a, a lot of what, how we look and how you know, culture evolves is very much uh, determined by the environment. And the environment, as we know, is dramatically changing. So it's hard to say what we're going to even, how we're going to survive or what we're going to look like you know, thousands of years into the future. I mean, uh, evolution is a, is a slow process, but we are definitely, like Dr. Todd said, we're speeding it up. Troy Coleman had an excellent question there. Is yes. civilization the death of natural selection? That's really good. 
Um, in fact, it's partially the cause of it. So if you think of the domestication of plants and animals, large numbers of people all of a sudden living together, that's forced us to evolve new mechanisms to digest dairy, mm -hmm. to digest rice, gluten, and all of these things, to actually get along with large numbers, <laughs> to have pathogens, measles, and mumps, and rubella, and smallpox spreading around, so we had to evolve. Civilization, it's like moving to a uh, jungle into the savannah, or moving from one island to another. It's actually created a different human environment. It's a different landscape that we need to yeah, quickly adapt to, and, and unfortunately, sometimes it doesn't always happen as quickly as we want, and that's when you have you know, mass die-offs of humans, it happens. Rachel Thompson asks, why address these kinds of comments at all and shed more public light on something so obviously invalid? I, I get asked, when I'm a creationist, I'm asked that very question, but I think they do need good responses. If those questions go unanswered, people just assume, oh, they, they don't can't know, yeah. answer them, therefore they must be right. I mean, it's a, it's a logical fault to make that assumption, but um, I think we need to push back um, whenever possible. And I hate to, I mean, it's the thing that, you know, age old comment about there is no such thing as a dumb question. I try to be as kind as possible because I do get young folk asking the same question as Tim Allen asks. Um, clearly, if you really wanted to know the answer, you just Google it. There are tons of great articles out there and fun literature to explain why there are still apes if we quote unquote evolved from them because of the common answer. Um, but at the same time, I feel like if we just dismiss them all together, like Dr. Todd said, they'll just what you're talking about, creationism is right, evolution doesn't exist, and, and we and we lose people in the fight against, you know, willful ignorance, and I, more than anything, I think we want to see a more science literate uh, world in the United States, especially since those voters out there, I want them voting with their mind, and hopefully their mind is science literate, because a lot of policies need to be informed by um, peer-reviewed science. Uh, including things like evolution and understanding uh, the rules of evolution and how it works. Any more questions? Oh wait, Todd, don't we have a little friend there? We just wanted to we just wanted to do this. This is our our baboon skull that we wanted to say hi to from Ethiopia. So while it's not an ape, it is a monkey. Yes. Related to apes, sharing common ancestry. Astro Stan asks, are there events or things that can increase or decrease evolution? And if possible, does that mean that eventually evolution will reach a cap? Changing environments clearly um, affect evolution, but even long periods of stasis. So basically evolution never stops. Again, every generation, every generation, every new child born is a combination of new genes inherited at random from the parents. So there, we're always putting forth new combinations of genes that may or may not survive, either in a changing environment or a stable environment. So just because of the way biology works, I mean, evolution is the most fundamental fact, the most fundamental part of biology, and so it will never be capped. Yeah, I mean, down to the cellular level, it, it, it keeps on going. It might not, see, that's the thing that I think is hard, is it, it happens so slowly that it's hard to see times. I, or I, it literally is invisible to, like, the naked eye. Um, you, know, you have this allele that will fight off that disease. You don't know about it until you're exposed to that disease. But your grandchildren might survive because you passed on a key gene in a disease that you don't see for two more generations, but when it pops up, bam. You're very thankful you have it. Okay, Let's see, Jason Baker. What's the closest link to our ape ancestry? Oh, did we do this one before? We can do it. I mean, we can. I mean, do we want to start listing hominids? Artie? Well, I mean. <laughs> 
it, it's not clear if they mean which ape is our yeah. closest living relative or which fossil species is closest to that common ancestor. And there's actually several um, fossil species. We actually have three candidates for that closest link, if you will. Um, Sahil anthropus um, and um, Chetiensis, Artipithecus, um, and Aurora and Tugenensis, all existing somewhere between five and a half and six and a half million years ago, right near that six million year split between chimps. All three might be on our side of the break. None of them might be. Some might be before it. Some might actually be chimps. Yeah, you don't know. Or chimp answers. Chimp answers. But just real quickly, our closest genetic relative, our living relatives, our chimpanzees and bonobos that roughly share 98.7% of our DNA. So thanks so much for watching, you guys. Again, this was Dr. Todd Disatel graciously letting us use his wonderful lab. This is the back of the lab. And I'm Natalia Reagan, a Star Talk All Star, and I loved answering these questions and keep asking these questions. Stay curious and keep looking. Thank you. And wash your hands. <laughs> hey, did you like that? Cool video, huh? Well, how about a bunch of cool videos, all commercial free, plus exclusive original content that you can't find anyplace else, all on StarTalkAllAccess.com.